I'm Benjamin Bergen, the president of the Council of Canadian Innovators. CCI is a business council that works with over 150 companies across Canada on innovation policy. Benjamin, thanks so much for taking the time. It's really going to be a pleasure speaking to you. I'm, I'm excited about it already. Um, let's start broadly with the digital economy. Uh, what are the main forces and trends you see shaping it? And when you look at Canada in general, what do you identify as our strengths, weaknesses, maybe opportunities within it? That's a great question. And thanks for obviously having me. I think, you know, when we talk about the digital economy, it often kind of gets wrapped up in a, in a couple of different terms, whether it be, you know, the intangible, the innovation, and it can often sometimes seem abstract. But really what it comes down to is really the machines and software that ultimately, you know, animate and create the digital future that we're in. And there's three things that really underpin that, that makes it different from the tangible economy. And that really is talent, uh, IP and data, um, and really the systems that enforce uh, the regulations around the IP and data. So thinking about things like trade agreements, standards and regulations. And the fuel really within the digital economy is talent. It is the raw material that is animating and really leading forward uh, this uh, new economy. Canada has a really great track record of education, of really producing top talent. Um, but what we're seeing is that the uh, forces that are in the talent space right now have actually never been harder. And what I mean by that is that uh, the pay for highly skilled workers is really being exacerbated by not just the need for talent in Canada, but the talent globally. As an example, Amazon has actually doubled its base salary from $160,000 US to $350,000 US. And so you now have Canadian firms having to compete for these highly skilled workers, which really you know, drive uh, wealth and prosperity, as, as I mentioned, um, and, and, and really finding it a challenge. Further kind of behind this piece is really that, you know, there just is not enough talent in the ecosystem. And so that is driving up wages and really leading to a challenge for Canadian companies to find those folks. It's estimated that by uh, 2025, 250,000 positions in the ICT space are not going to be filled. And so figuring out how you know we as a country can help mitigate that issue, I think will be really, really critical uh, because it is the, one of the major constraints on uh, Canadian economic uh, growth. The other area where I would say uh, that Canada um, and particularly innovators struggle is really around uh, some of the regulations that flow from IP and data. So Canada doesn't have a comprehensive IP strategy. We don't have a comprehensive data strategy. And, and with that, what you see ultimately is uh, the pooling out of uh, our good ideas and of the data that drives a lot of those uh, algorithms and other uh, economic opportunities. Well, let's let's dive deep into talent since you mentioned that as the biggest challenge we're facing. And as you said, uh, it's not a short term one either. Um, what needs to be done uh, by our governments, federal, provincial, uh, and also by our companies to attract the best talent, first of all? Uh, and and to retain it to be able to support the growth of our innovation economy. Yeah, so I think that's that's a great question. That's really something that that we at the council are kind of tasked with day in and day out. And one thing I think might be interesting for your uh, for your viewers is that the talent crisis um, has also changed, and and it really has been COVID that has animated a lot of that change. Um, we wrote a piece called Brain Drain 2.0, uh, and you know Canadians are familiar with the idea of brain drain, where you know our best and brightest leave and go to other jurisdictions, and that you know predominantly in the tech space is often to Silicon Valley. Um, but what we're seeing with Brain Drain 2.0 is that uh, Canadian workers are no longer uh, needing to leave the country. They can open up their laptops uh, in Winnipeg or Saskatoon, Vancouver or Toronto and work remotely. And so that is putting uh, even sort of greater pressure on domestic firms to be able uh, to keep and retain talent here. And so what we really need is a policy response from both federal and provincial governments that uh, help uh, uh, keep uh, highly skilled workers here in Canada, but also expands the talent pool. And the big thing there that uh, we at the council really are pushing for 
is obviously an immigration system that is robust and is able to bring highly skilled workers to the country. Um, so something that we worked on back in 2018 um, uh, to be made a, a full program was the Global Talent Strategy. Um, and that's a, a visa program that allows highly skilled workers to enter Canada in a two week processing time. And so it's those types of programs which can do some heavy lifting in terms of bringing people to the country. Obviously, you know, we are seeing um, a, a very concerning issue that's happening in the world, obviously, with what's going on in Russia and the war in, in Ukraine, uh, you know, areas like Hong Kong, where you're seeing them sort of being um, repulled back into, into China. And that, you know, that potentially, um, you know, does cause huge changes in, in, in sort of the labor market. And Canada as a jurisdiction is extremely desirable for folks to come to, especially uh, for highly skilled workers. So making sure that, you know, we're providing those opportunities for people to come here, I think is critical. It will help them, you know, have a new life, uh, but it also, you know, potentially can help uh, our own domestic ecosystem grow, expand and fill some of the needs that are required. So I think talent um, and immigration is duly linked. Uh, but then on, on the more uh, provincial side, I think really making sure that our universities and our academic institutions are tooled to actually respond to what innovators need. Um, and that is, you know, building uh, co-op programs uh, that are, you know, uh, at least a year long. Um, you know, currently they often sit at sort of the three, four month period. Um, and that's really not enough time to get, you know, students ingested into companies and working with them. The other piece is also how do we orientate our academic institutions with industry? Uh, you know, currently uh, the structures or, or some of the structures that are in place helps really funnel talent uh, from our top universities towards for multinational firms rather than looking at you know domestic uh, companies for these people to be employed. And if we do go back to the premise that talent really is that jet fuel in the digital economy, making sure that we're building pathways where our highly skilled workers that are and, and our students that we're training and, and paying for as taxpayers are actually going back into companies that are generating IP data and ultimately wealth from that will be critical. Now, I want to shift gears a bit and speak about capital because just like talent, uh, money is also uh, the, the fuel that the innovation economy needs to, uh, to chug along and accelerate. Um, we've seen the amount of capital coming into Canada or coming out of Canada increase uh, over the last years, which is great. Uh, but a lot of people that we interview still say that there's there's still not enough. Um, what are your views on that? And what do you see in terms of maybe policy changes or funding mechanisms or other systems uh, that should be implemented in Canada to ensure that our scale ups have the have access to the capital they need to grow? Over 80 percent of that 15 billion dollars that was raised was U.S. capital. And so what that means is that the value creation that comes from high growth companies being fueled by U.S. investors ultimately doesn't end up residing within the country. And so when we think about the long term effects of this, ultimately what that is, is that that's uh, valuation and wealth creation that's going south of the border and not staying here within Canada. So. What we think really need to think about as a country is how can we build specific policies and tools that allows for our domestic firms, which you know create uh, wealth, are able to either keep more of the ownership here in Canada or provide uh, institutions, whether they be you know some of the large FIs or other uh, VCs, to actually have that capacity um, to be able to invest in our own domestic firms, especially often when they're trying to go for, for larger raises, whether that be CD or, or kind of above. Um, and that really is, I think, a task for policymakers and really is a task for um, the federal government to really figure out how do we build these tools so that capital flows um, really are coming from within our borders and not necessarily being so heavily reliant on uh, U.S. Um, uh, uh, VCs and institutions. Well, uh, allow me to put you on the spot because I know that you often do have a lot of policy recommendations or asks for the different levels of government and the regulators. If you had to uh, maybe touch on one or two points that would help us concretely tackle that challenge. Uh, what comes to mind? Yeah, so I think when we look at, you know, programs like Shred and IRAP and Superclusters, I think that direct investment so that um, by governments to make sure that there doesn't have to be as much um, dilutive capital and allow uh, 
owners to be able to maintain and keep uh, larger sections of, of, of their company, I think will be critical in order to, to keep valuation here. And then on the policy around sort of government looking at things like taxation, I think, you know, there are tools, programs like Vicky, um, which was a, a, an investment capacity that the federal government brought in, can be helpful in terms of helping to corral funds um, and make it more uh, attractive for uh, Canadians and, and other institutions to actually invest locally. In October 2020, the council, the CCI, and its members wrote an open letter to Prime Minister Trudeau, and you urged him that it's time to, for Canada to focus on nation building. And the letter stated that, and this is a quote, Canadians need a prosperity strategy. So I want to flip that question and put it back to you. If you had to design a Canadian prosperity strategy, uh, what would you uh, identify as its main pillars? And then the hopeful call to action is what would be the one thing that you would urge the prime minister to do uh, right now to, to implement, uh, to get that rolling? That's a great question. And, and thanks for kind of referencing that letter. It was a, a really sort of uh, strong uh, piece that the council put out and, and really received a lot of great uh, attention. So I think the first thing, you know, just from a bit of a framing perspective is, you know, what is a prosperity strategy? Um, and often in, uh, you know, the Canadian context, there's a bit of confusion where we confuse a prosperity strategy with a jobs strategy. Um, and so from a context setting, you know, where I really want Canada to, to play uh, um, in, in the prosperity strategy game is, is understanding that wealth and prosperity comes from IP and the data um, that is generated. And to give you that a bit of context, uh, back in uh, 1985, only 17% of the S&P 500's valuation came from the intangible economy. Fast forward to today, over 91% of the S&P's value comes from the intangible economy. So this really is where all of the wealth and prosperity is being generated in the 21st century. And if we're not um, creating successful technology companies that are able to generate the IP and data that I've mentioned, we're really not playing in that, uh, in that space. So kind of writ large, what I really want to see is a Canadian uh, strategy that ties in these two pieces in order for us to be able to pay for a, obviously, you know, the, the huge amounts of money we've spent on COVID um, through, you know, the taxation of these companies being successful and be the future of programs like education, healthcare, housing, transit, you name it. Um, and so that, that from a framing perspective is just kind of where I sort of uh, want to land. In terms of what that is, is going to really require, I think, you know, I've mentioned talent a number of times throughout this uh, conversation. And so, you know, if I had a chance to, uh, you know, bump into the prime minister or, or, you know, be able to really kind of dive into it, it really will be to uh, understand um, uh, the needs of uh, Canadian innovators on the talent side. So making sure that that really is a focus uh, of his government. Um, and then the other area really is around building strategies related to uh, intellectual property and, and, and data management as, as being the other two. From a call to action perspective, one of the things that the council has called for, and you've actually now seen, as I mentioned, in um, the Liberal government's uh, uh, plan, is a commitment to build an economic advisory council um, that will help guide the economy. And you know, our hope is that it will be uh, supported by domestic innovators, which can provide a perspective of the challenges and the issues that they're facing. 